If you want to support independent content like this show, the PlayStation Podcast Sacred Symbols, the Retro Podcast Knockback, and more, and get perks for doing so, please consider subscribing to Collins Last Stand on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Your support is essential. Thank you. My friends, wipe that New Year's fatigue out of your eyes for 2018 is no more. But even behind us now, it was an awesome year for video games, one worthy of celebration and reflection. Today's episode of SideQuest, the very first of 2019, is designed to look backwards, to celebrate my 10 favorite games of the last 365 days, and to tell you why I love them so darn much. Unlike last year's list though, I'm going to do things a little differently. For starters, I am going to put them in order of how much I like them, ending with my number one game, as opposed to being nebulous and just putting them in alphabetical order. I'm also going to start the list off with 10 more games that I want to give a quick shout out to before I get into the top 10, and those games will be in alphabetical order because I like to confuse you. When it comes to my 10 honorable mentions, I'm going to begin with Castlevania Requiem, which triumphantly brought both Symphony of the Night and Rondo of Blood to PS4 for the first time. It was awesome to play both games again, especially Symphony of the Night, which is one of the great games of all time but Konami obviously put zero effort into this collection, and it's hard to give it a full-throated recommendation because of that. I didn't spend a ton of time with it, but I really enjoyed Celeste by Matt Makes Games as well, and it's something I have to get back to, though I really don't understand where all of the Game of the Year slash 10 out of 10 accolades for it are coming from. It's cool, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Dead Cells from French studio Motion Twin mixed up the roguelike and Metroidvania genres in a really interesting way, and I loved its aesthetic and ambience, though I'm not entirely sold on the general idea of procedurally generated Metroidvania games. I'm not sure they truly work. For 25 hours or so, I delved back into Dragon Quest XI, and it was a joy to be back in that universe again for really the first time in nearly a decade, what with Dragon Quest X not being a real Dragon Quest game, and never being released outside of Japan either way. Still, I love traditional JRPGs, and few franchises, if any, do it better than Dragon Quest. Far Cry 5 from Ubisoft Montreal and Ubisoft Toronto was an awesome romp too, one that I platinumed and had a ton of fun with. I love the setting and the story, though I found the ending a bit strange. Either way, though, I'm amped up for its direct sequel, Far Cry New Dawn, in the coming months. And man, did I enjoy Guacamelee 2 from my friends at Drinkbox Studios as well. The gameplay in particular, its brawler-like mechanics and agility-focused movements are such a pleasure. Drinkbox really nailed the sequel, and I'd love to see a third game in the series one day. I really dug the Metroidvania game Hollow Knight a lot too, though it did originally come to PC in 2017, and so I wasn't entirely sure it should even be considered for my list. It was a really tough adventure, really vague, but in a good way. I really liked it. The Spyro Reignited trilogy from Toys for Bob really surprised me. I wasn't a Spyro fan when I was younger, and yet I got sucked into playing all three games and platinuming two of them. They're really great titles to mindlessly play while tearing through one's podcast back catalog, for instance. Super Life of Pixel from developer White Moon Dreams was a really awesome Vita game, a side-scrolling action platformer based on gaming history. It's really cool if you're into where games have been more than where they are now. And finally, I need to tip my cap to Tacoma from Fulbright, which I played just days ago. I loved it, though it ran like garbage on PS4, crashing about five times. It also originally came to other platforms in 2017, so I'm reluctant to give it any 2018 honors. But now, my list. At number 10, I'm going to put Tetris Effect, a Japanese-developed Tetris game that really knocked it out of the park. Now, I know it's weird for some to see any sort of Tetris game in a top 10 list, especially with how many iterations there are of the game, and frankly because of how ubiquitous it's been since the late Soviet days. Whether in arcades, or on home consoles and PCs, or on handhelds, or on smartphones, it's literally everywhere. But Tetris Effect is truly special, a game that expertly intertwines music and ambience with the Tetris gameplay so many of us know and love. It's visually and sonically stunning, and it almost puts me in a bit of a trance when I play it. You can also play it on PSVR, where it's pretty rad in its own right, but in reality, it's fine as it is on your normal PS4. There are a myriad of options here too, with lots of game modes to explore, tons to unlock, leaderboards to scramble up, a full complement of trophies, and much more. While I thought it was a little expensive at $39.99, I think it's a steal at a lower price point, and as an old-school Tetris fan and player, it's easily the best Tetris experience I have ever played, one that I think will stick around with an expansive audience for a long time to come. Speaking of PlayStation VR, I'm putting the game Moss at number 9. Moss was developed by a studio called Polyarch, and it revolves around a tiny little mouse named Quill. Quill in turn goes on an adventure guided by you, the player, a player able to see much more than a static screen with the help of your VR unit. Is there something behind that wall? Stand up, move your head, and see for yourself. There's so much cute and clever about this game, but what I think I love the most is its small scale. It's a short game, yes, but I'm literally talking about its scale. 
Quill seems normal sized until you compare her to everything else. The trees and the water and the buildings. Its scope in this regard is pretty remarkable. It's cool to think you're walking across a little bridge only to realize that bridge is a rotting piece of old human metal armor that's been sitting in shallow water for centuries. Satisfying to play and smart in its presentation of a world that in the day past ran amok and met a violent end. Moss shocked me in how immersive it was, and if you're a VR fan, you've got to give it a go. It's not locked to PSVR either, you can also play it via VR headsets on your PC if you so choose. At 8, I've got to put the Mega Man X Legacy Collection that combined Mega Man X, X2, and X3 from the Super Nintendo, and X4 from the original PlayStation into one appropriately priced and well-fleshed-out compilation. Indeed, Capcom has been exceeding expectations with their retro anthologies for a few years now, including with the classic Mega Man games, the old Capcom Disney games, the Street Fighter games, and more. Unlike the aforementioned Castlevania Requiem, which included great games but was also clearly half-assed in its delivery, Mega Man X Legacy Collection was completely deliberate, with attention paid to every minor detail. Yes, the ports of the games themselves are solid, but this goes even further than that, because this collection is absolutely chock full of extras. Concept and official artwork galore, full soundtracks, cut content, new game modes, and even the ability to change each game into their native Japanese iteration. I was blown away by how Capcom tended to all the little things that truly make anthologies like this tick, and I was even more pleased that they finally listened to fans and gave us a full suite of trophies to chase, which added even more texture. Sneaking in at number 7 is a game called Reverie, which I had the pleasure of playing on PS Vita, but which you can play on PS4 if you choose. The best way to describe Reverie is that it's a short and sweet old-school Zelda-type game with a bit of an Earthbound flair. Developed by Rainbite, a small studio out of New Zealand, Reverie won't take you much more than 5 or 6 hours to beat, but that's kind of its charm, at least for me. I like long, meaty adventures for sure, but I also like games that I can pick up, play, enjoy, and then put down and walk away from. Reverie represented that to me. It's clearly something that was made with a lot of love and a lot of care to be sure, but I also truly feel like it could be the first game in the universe. There's something infinitely charming about it, something really appealing about its basic combat, its understandable inventory system, and its bizarre set of characters. A lot of games draw inspiration from what came before them. There are retro-inspired and old-school-inspired games littering every gaming ecosystem. It's no longer novel. So in a way, it's even more novel when something inspired by the past comes out and kills it. Don't be fooled. Reverie absolutely rules. At number 6, I have to tip my cap to Sony Santa Monica's Extraordinary God of War, which came exclusively to PlayStation 4 in the earlier half of 2018. The design might of God of War has been well-tread, and the team at Sony Santa Monica has a great deal to be proud of. Remember, God of War was a franchise in serious decline following God of War Ascension, and Sony Santa Monica itself had a separate game cancelled well into development that could have easily ended the studio entirely. Corey Barlog and his team came together, though, and did what I think wasn't necessarily possible. They reinvented something old, made a tired protagonist new again, and wildly exceeded my expectations. The story of Kratos and, well, boy, was riveting. The pseudo-non-linearity and pseudo-open world it created was a pleasure to explore, and the combat was magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Now, I think this game does have a lot of small things wrong with it that drag it down a bit. Its menus are obtuse, its quick travel system is terrible, etc., but these are minor gripes. God of War is very clearly one of PS4's must-play exclusives, and its incredible sales tell the tale well. We've certainly not seen the last of Kratos, after all. When it comes to number 5, I think we should stick with the PlayStation 4 exclusives and throw Insomniac's outrageous Spider-Man game into the mix. I really, really love this title, and that's saying something because as many of you know, I'm simply not a comic book guy even in the least sense of the word. In fact, I'm more often than not put off by comics and anything involving them full stop, but there are certain exceptions to the rule. I love Batman as a character for instance, and I really dig Spider-Man and his universe too, so I went into this one with an open mind, and knowing full well the caliber of the team that made it, I was expecting pretty big things. And big things were delivered. Spider-Man felt right, it felt fun to play. Perhaps a bit button mashy in combat at times, but when it came to traversal, my god, Spider-Man is an absolute masterclass. I loved its rendition of Manhattan. I loved how there was so much to do. I loved the side quests and collectible marathons. I loved the villains. I mean, I pretty much loved all of it. Like the aforementioned God of War, Spider-Man is absolutely getting a sequel, which makes me excited for what Insomniac could do next. At number 4, I'm going to delicately place Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, which was a bit of a surprise announcement and release from earlier in 2018. Now, don't be confused, there are two interrelated Bloodstained games, and this is, for lack of a better term, the lesser one. An appetizer, as it were. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, being produced and led by ex-Castlevania lead Koji Igarashi, is still coming at some point in 2019, and like its direct influence, Symphony of the Night, it'll be a Metroidvania-style game. Curse of the Moon, on the other hand, was developed on the side by uber-talented Japanese team Inicreates, the guys behind Mega Man 9 and 10, Gunvolt, and more, and it's entirely influenced by arguably the greatest non-Metroidvania Castlevania game ever, Castlevania 3: Dracula's Curse. 
I play it on PS4 and Switch, but you can play it on Vita, 3DS, Xbox One, or PC if you'd like, and I highly recommend that you do. It's the perfect love letter to truly old school Castlevania, and because it was so unexpected, it had a little extra flair associated with it. If you love Castlevania 3 like me, and if you're looking for a truly difficult yet bite-sized adventure, this one's absolutely for you. For my third game, I'm going to give love to Time Spinner, a Metroidvania game that quietly released this past September. I played it on PS4, but it's also on PC and Vita, and guys and gals, it is easily the best kept secret of the year for me. I had absolutely no idea that the tiny team at Lunar Ray Games was making what they were making. This game is Symphony of the Night meets a sci-fi, time-traveling, almost fantasy star-like story and setting, and it is extraordinarily good. It understands what makes Symphony of the Night so amazing without completely copying it. It has an awesome combat system, a unique inventory system, a side quest system, and multiple worlds to traverse. It's so much fun that I beat it twice. I really love the soundtrack too, which was so fitting to the adventure at hand. My critiques of the game are few and far between, and indeed, I'd probably put it in the top 5 Metroidvanias I've ever played. That's really saying something since, as you can see, I dwell a great deal in this genre, and play many games emanating from it. Time Spinner is just that good, just that special, and as is becoming a common refrain here, this one also deserves a sequel, and I really, really hope it gets one. In the runner-up spot at number 2, I'm going to give Detroit Become Human the accolades and credit that it deserves, accolades and credit that have been in astonishingly short supply in a year that was admittedly great for gaming. Detroit Become Human is a PS4 exclusive adventure game from the French team Quantic Dream, which you likely know from the PS3 exclusive narrative-driven games Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls. Now, I loved Heavy Rain, but I didn't care for Beyond, and so I had very low expectations going into Detroit. Detroit, in turn, showed me how foolish I was for not believing. Quantic Dream's newest game is a feat of intertwining narrative, a story of near-future AI and the trials and tribulations they face. I loved it. I absolutely adored it, in fact. I think it's a special game and shows the power of our medium outside of action-oriented gameplay, violence, and death, which is totally fine, but not necessary for every game. The reality from my perspective is that games media largely has it in for Quantic Dream and its leader, David Cage, and they were never going to give this game a fair shake, and that hurt it with audiences. But I gave it a fair shake, and I hope you do too. It's an awesome experience. And finally, my number one game of the year is obvious, Red Dead Redemption 2. What can I possibly say about Rockstar's epic that hasn't already been said ad nauseum since it launched this past fall? It is an absolute high watermark in so many ways that it's hard to believe any studio anytime soon will surpass it in its totality. Its story of its waning Wild West and its equally waning population of old-time pulp novel cowboys and criminals is so well told, so well acted, and so well executed that it's frankly Hollywood Oscar-worthy stuff. And the world is so fully realized, so beautiful, and so expansive that it boggles the mind. There's something to do in every corner, someone to speak with, a quest to undertake, or simply an oddity to observe. Yes, its gameplay needs some work, there is no doubt, but that it's my number one game speaks so loudly to everything else it does so well, everything else it does so much better than any other game ever attempted. It's ambitious in the truest sense of the word, and let's be real, there's a lot of sameness in games and very little actual ambition. Well, Rockstar just raised the bar about five miles. We'll see who has the gumption to surpass what they accomplished in 2019 and beyond.